Welcome to another CEO Wisdom Pod with David Wolf with us today. David is the CEO of a podcasting company that's called Odivita Studios, Arveda Studios. He's also the founder yeah, right. of that company. Uh, he does audiobooks as well, not only podcasts. We're going to have a nice convo, lots of overlap. David is more on the back end in production and me more on the front end of things. So and we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, just podcasts. There's multiple moving pieces to pods. And yeah, I'm always eager to talk with folks like Dave. Uh, David, can you tell us a bit more about yourself, how you got into podcasting and a bit sure. more about your company as well? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I, I really, my origin is in creative uh, generation. I'm a musician originally. I was a drummer, then keyboardist, grew up in Chicago and uh learned how to eventually how to write music and score, write songs, uh, film scoring, all of that stuff. And uh, studied briefly at Berkeley College of Music and then started my own company when I turned eh, roughly 26. Uh, right after I got married, uh, my wife and I moved to Dallas, Texas, and we set up a shop called uh, called Cry Wolf Music and did um, a lot of music for radio, TV, film, children's programming. I worked with filmmakers. I did some documentary film work. And it was really all about scoring the music. Uh, after some amount of time, um, I, I started to migrate over to an interest in business. And so I moved to the business side of the world and just kind of reapplying my music skills to other things. And um, after uh, I'm going to compress it here uh, because of our time element today, uh, Charles, I uh, ultimately um, started uh, after some time doing some other business activities. I did one turnaround here and that. Uh, moved my family to Albuquerque, New Mexico to do that, and then started dabbling in podcasting right around 2005 or six. So it was fairly early. And I created a show called uh, Small Biz America, which was nothing else than very similar to what you now do today. I was, but I had no business around it. It was just, let me interview people, open up the mic. I was traveling places with a portable Zoom. I was doing very, very down and dirty. And uh, eventually we did get some radio syndication and terrestrial radio alongside the uh the the rss distribution model and i learned the art of interviewing and i learned how to produce and you know kind of reapplying my music and editing and mixing skills to pure production and then eventually uh started to attract a team which today we have six core on our team uh coo cmo guy that runs the audiobook side a guy that runs the podcast side and then um and then another guy who's full-time who's one of our senior editors uh, audio editors and recording engineers. And so today we have a company that produces about 200 audiobooks a year. And uh, we have about 45 or 50 podcasts in production, you know, episodic podcasts, typically they're business shows, uh, but, you know, related sometimes a little bit outside of that margin, but typically there is a, there's a business um, uh, component to it there. As you well know, Charles, it's a lot about lead gen, inviting people on your show you want to be doing business with and, uh, Good things happen when you're recording with someone on a show like this, right? So, so, and then the audiobook side has been scaling as well. These two businesses are almost even in revenue for us. Um, and there we're working with publishers and publishing service providers. So these are like ghost writers and editors that help authors get the book done. And then at the end of that process, we uh, add audio to the mix and we produce audiobooks in two different ways. We have a casting team for fiction typically. And then for nonfiction, a lot of times we're working with the author in a live session like this, recording uh, their audiobook. They're actually narrating their own book. They're the voice of their brand. They're the connectivity to market. So we like to interview them uh, or not interview. I'm sorry, have them read the book. Uh, so separate from an interview, of course. So that's the quick version of Audavita Studios. Um, back to you. Your, your ikigai. Um... What is it? And the ikigai in business, in my opinion, is learning, growing your network and making money at the same time. Um, I think podcasts like pretty much checks all of these boxes. So yeah. tell us about why you decide to invest most of your time in podcasting and why do you think it can be a, a top growth uh, mechanism for any business owner out there? Excellent, absolutely excellent question. And it's really a center for both you and I and the businesses we run uh, separately. So 
Um, and, and, and I'm the person that really talks to business owners and leadership uh, folks and, and, and authors sometimes all day about these things. Um, at the center, you know, we're sort of dealing in a world where the democratization of media, you know, the, the movement from three networks when I was a kid, I'm a little younger, a little older than you, but uh, three networks on television, you know, a bunch of radio that was linear programming, moving into this radio on demand and so many people that can have their own voice now in their own show, their own persona, their own branded environment where they're driving a conversation uh, is so ripe for forming relationships, so ripe for really sort of leaning into the the um, the celebration of recording and distributing, which is very attractive to people that aren't doing it. So rather than calling up a prospect, let's say, and, and, and inviting them to uh, have a conversation about doing business, inviting them onto your show really elevates that experience for both of you, but per absolutely for your guest. So what's fascinating about what's happening is guests equal a prospect, equal a lead, equal possible business growth and a network effect because you're distributing widely through either YouTube or the RSS mechanism if you're audio only. We like to do both now. There was a time where we were audio only. My music you know, background really led me into audio, but surprisingly, we're now a video production company as well. So as you do, we're distributing our clients' uh, shows to YouTube and also out to the RSS feeds. But all of these things contribute to a, a massive leverage because of the power of, of RSS, the power of YouTube, and the ability to create electricity in a conversation like we're having today uh, that can in, uh, end up in, uh, engaging in a, a business transaction or a series of transactions. So, um, and oddly, I'll add that we're, we haven't actually had an Auto Vita podcast until now we're starting one on the audiobook side of our business. We have a host and a JV partner that's going to come in, uh, Diamond Michael Scott, who's got a PR uh, and sort of book review and promotion company. It's a very interesting model. And so he's going to start to, uh, for this very reason, we're going to start promoting what we do in audiobooks vis-a-vis this uh, inviting authors to come on and talk about their books. So we're now starting to actually do the things that we recommend others to do, which is sort of interesting. It took us about five years <laughs> to, to find the bandwidth. So, Right. And what AI tools are you using on the podcasting end, whether it's on the front end or the back end? Yeah, great question. So on the back end, we are using pod squeeze right now to generate uh, transcriptions and from their derivative uh, assets like show notes, uh, uh, short posts for social. Had the founder uh, on We're my also pod. using, we've also looked at, I'm sorry, I missed your question. I had the founder on my pod of pod squeeze. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also use um, um, Opus uh, for, yeah, for video clips. And uh, those two tools have been a tremendous, tremendous efficiency help in a world where, and, you know, it's, we've sort of disintermediated a lot of the video editors, I think, around a lot of this, because a lot of guys out there that are doing, you know, clips, so-called clips for social as a production model in their small businesses, and it's it's disintermediating them, which is unfortunate, but it's just a natural disruption. I mean, as we talk about AI, the other sort of danger or the risk to my business is the advent of AI on the... Um, well, really call it the front end of audiobook production, where you have Apple now generating voice uh, with their voice tech and their proprietary voice tech. And then we do work with partners uh, overseas that are doing voice tech, and they're doing pretty good voice modeling. There's a library of voices, and then we also have a program where we clone the author's voice, and then we use it for their future books, their, you know, the current or future projects. But all of these things are going to drive the costs down, and they're going to be a very different solution for an author than what we sell now, which is a very customized approach with high touch, a real person. Um, I think uh, it's gonna create another tier of business that it's somewhat uncertain and always with uncertainty, there's risk in a business model. So we have our eyes on it, but back to podcasting. Um, uh, those are the tools, the two main tools that we use on the back end of our podcasting. We're not really using it for audio editing as of yet. We do use some uh, noise reduction. Um, we use Descript for some things, um, but more selectively. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes. And 
what are you focusing on for the rest of this year? There's two months remaining. What are your top goals? That's great. So it's really a large goal. We are working with a, uh, um, a partner now that's come in to help us um, structure our sales systems. So we have uh, an outsourced partner that generates LinkedIn activity for, on my LinkedIn, which is approaching about 20,000 now. So not too bad. Um, and we're really working on the funnel management, which is not something that we've done. It was very organic to get to this. We're about a million, a little over a million dollar company now, top line. It was, it was very organic growth to, to a million, but I think, and you know, this, a lot of companies that kind of, there's, they get to that point and then in order to scale, you have to be talking to more people. So what we're now, and what I'm investing in both energetically and with some amount of capital is creating more David Wolfs that can talk to more people um, and also managing and filtering the funnel so that we're not spending time talking with people that are not likely to convert to a client that's appropriate for us, that's a good fit for us. So that's the goal for this quarter, um, top, top and center. The rest of the business, Charles, runs pretty turnkey. We've got a fabulous team, as I mentioned earlier, and they really, everybody shows up and does their stuff and uh, good client communications and, uh, you know, all the way around and, uh, and uh, happy clients. So the rest of it is working. We just need to push through more volume and throughput through our existing infrastructure and us team. So that's the focus. And on the sell side of things, like yeah. what precisely, what strategy will you use? For example, I use cold email AI on my end to generate a bunch yes. of meetings. I yes. get probably like yeah. 50 meetings a week uh, for the some of my agencies and the services that I offer. That's what would cool. be your strategy on that end? So uh, we, as I mentioned, we have an outsource that's generating, uh, a, uh, they're using some AI for their email generations where it's actually referencing specific posts that the target uh, recipient of the email has uh, authored and therefore there's engagement right more readily. And I think that doubled the response rate on the email marketing side. We're also... Um, you know, and all this is coming together as we're reorganizing our systems, right? So uh, then we also, uh, that same partner does a lot of cold outreach to selected targets and groups on LinkedIn through my account. So the combination of those two sources of leads, plus our referral networks on the publishing side, we have publishers and publishing services that have a stream of authors that they'll send to us to do audiobooks for. Uh, but the podcast side is a little more challenging uh, to market in some ways. Uh, and as you have telegraphed, you know, 50 meetings, you know, you know, more is more. It's really about numbers and finding the appropriate uh, clients for your particular model. So um, we're not the least expensive solution for podcasting. We do a lot of customization on the video side. We do, you know, motion graphic intros and outros and music and voiceover. Not everybody wants those things, but they are available. And quite a few of our podcasters take advantage of that sort of broadcast production sensibility. That's really informed by me and my, you know, I have a history in that world uh, doing stuff for commercials and big brands and stuff. So um, that definitely has informed how we approach it. But there are all other clients that leave it raw. There's not a lot of editing. They jump right in. There's no big fancy intro. So we're seeing a movement into a lighter, a lighter touch too. So, uh, you know, it's a lot of adaptive stuff going on, but uh, but uh, that's our strategy in terms of funnel and it's going to continue to evolve, I'm sure. And what niche or titles or ideal customer person in your, in your opinion would be more likely to want to start a podcast and invest in an agency like yours or mine? Yeah, no, I think that uh, we are looking to up level. So there are a lot of solopreneurs and smaller businesses, micro businesses or hobbyists um, and they don't have a big uh, spend available to invest in the content marketing endeavor that we call podcasting. So um, we're really looking for more corporate clients, you know, in, in technology and in fintech, in manufacturing. Cannabis is coming up a little bit because of the growth there. Um, you know, transportation, supply chain, uh, industrial, if you like. Uh, we do some work in nonprofits as well, and some of them raise considerable amounts of money to, to get the messages out. We have one that we do that centers on the low vision population around uh, macular degeneration. We work with a nonprofit out of Philadelphia 
uh, and that's been very successful. And she's used the podcasting in, um, as a centerpiece for her fundraising, which has been fascinating in a nonprofit organization. So that has some mobility, I think. Um, but getting away from the solo and more into teams where they can really use our production services, which is our expertise. Right. And what do you think is in store for podcasting? What is the future of podcasting? We've heard about avatar AIs and I'm currently working on one with a partner to have a Charles AI interview people. Then would it be one AI interviewing another? Could we scale that and even produce a hundred episodes a day and live edit them? For example, if I speak right now, um, there would be a video uh, made by AI that would represent uh, what I'm saying here and would give out pictures to the audience uh, to help them learn um, and memorize faster. What other futuristic possibilities could there be for the world of podcasting? Well, you've just kind of answered your own question in my view. I think that um, the uh, avatar, you know, sort of the AI generated um persona has very interesting implications. And, and I think both negative and positive, there are like so many things AI. Um, I'm really fascinated by what you just laid out. The, the ability to at scale to disseminate knowledge capital um, at a faster rate and a higher velocity, more volume. That to me feels like a very productive use of AI. Um, the counterpoint to all of this, I suppose, is that at a certain point, you're taking out some amount of human nuance, the emotions, the the uh, the underlying um, soul of the interviewer and guest, which could be, and I can argue both sides of this, suggests possibly um, the dehumanization on some level. We're experiencing some of this with the audiobooks because... They're really good, but you can sense the lack of, you know, it doesn't work for fiction and intense dialogue and where there's a lot of emotional content. You can tweak it to do that stuff, but it, it, a human ear can really, after some amount of time, on some level, even if it's an underlying subtle sense of it, it doesn't feel like it's connecting as a human. And so to those people, I say, Let's just know that it's not absolute human. It's a projection of humanity, but still useful in terms of disseminating knowledge. So I'll say it there. I know we're, we're getting short on time, but um, but I love the vision you've, and I love the futurism. And I watch a lot of podcasts that talk about some of this stuff uh, on YouTube. It's very interesting. And it's, again, there's a lot of different levels and implications present. There is. Well, thank you for today, David. Uh, where could people find out more about you? Thank you for asking. We are at www.audivita.com. That's A-U-D-I, Audi, like the car, Audi, and Vita, with a V, V-I-T-A, dot com. And um, that means the sound of life. That's what Audivita means. It's derived from Latin. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you so Thanks much. for having me. My pleasure.